Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world. I can't wait for this interview. My guest today is Claudia Watts Edge. Claudia Watts Edge had a profound near-death experience in 1984 where she and her newborn baby died together in a sea of blood and pain. Her journey into fully remembering her unusual NDE experience took over 30 years to surface. Claudia has written two books exploring the spiritual mysteries of the other side through her memories and dreams called Gifts from the Edge stories of the other side and gifts from the edge volume two lessons from the other side and she's currently collecting stories from other experiences for her third book we touched heaven this is her story and this is her passion claudia thank you so much i'm so excited for you to be on passion harvest welcome thank, thank you and thank you for the wonderful welcome i really appreciate it i've been looking forward to this Me too. i have watched your videos and i think i i'm sincere about wanting to speak with you i just feel such an a kinship to you after so many wonderful um, podcasts that you've presented and your openness to learning new things and your and it sounds like you've got a wonderful audience so yes. we'll i'm going to enjoy chatting with you well, I can't wait to hear about all your incredible experiences and you talk about dreams from your books, but if you'd like to dive right in and feel comfortable, I'd love okay. to start with your pre or near-death experience or the events leading up to it. You bet. Um, my my near-death experience was in 1984. I was pregnant with my fifth baby, fifth and last baby. I'd had normal pregnancies and no issues, and so... Uh, the day that all of this happened, I had gone into a contraction that did not release. My stomach was just as hard as it could be, and it stayed that way for hours and hours until I really listened to um, something that I want to talk a bit about today is intuition and, and listening to our intuition, because I because intuition is a gift that's been given us, and sometimes we, we don't ignore it to our own, you know, um, fail safe and whatnot, we, we end up getting hurt or in trouble because we, we said, you know, I really should have listened to that little voice. Yeah. That particular day, I did listen to that little voice and I decided I needed to go to the hospital. And as I was talking, at, standing at the nurse's station and kind of explaining what was happening, she, um, she told me, well, it sounds like you've only really had one contraction. So I don't think that this is going to happen anytime soon. So why don't you and your husband walk around the hospital? Let's get things kind of moving along and, and then come back and see us in a while. And I didn't walk 10 feet from that nurse's station when uh, I got to the elevator and I sat down in a wheelchair and I said, I, I don't feel right about this. I think there's something wrong and I really need the staff to hear me and so I sat in this wheelchair and my husband said what are you doing because we're supposed to be walking around you're not, you're not doing as instructed and and I fall again followed that instinct and I said you know I'm going to go back and talk to them and it was barely around the corner from where we were and I uh, I said you know I just I feel like there's something wrong I need to be looked at or something and so she said well you know being five children, your due date is one day away. So most likely you're going to be having a baby today. And so she gave me a gown and sent me in the, in the uh, kind of the locker room to get, to get dressed, sent my husband off into the waiting room with a uh, clipboard full of insurance papers and okay. all of that stuff that they require. Right. And um, as I stood there putting the gown on, I noticed drops of blood were were hitting the floor and I it, it I'd never seen anything like that um uh, prior to giving birth and so I rang for the nurse I said you know something's wrong and she says oh no calm down it's it's uh this is normal you probably just pushed too hard in the bathroom and and I said well wait a minute I haven't been to the bathroom and at that time 
it was like a large bucket of blood just dumped between my legs onto the floor onto my onto my legs my feet the floor the nurse's legs uh, her shoes it, uh, the walls it was mm -hmm. it was this huge bath of blood everywhere and both of our eyes you know got about this big and and it was she just kind of pushed me onto a gurney that was nearby now granted this is still a locker room this isn't an operating room or anything but she started calling for code and by the time that they found a doctor, because they had told mine not to bother because, you know, I had a long way off and another of the doctors on that floor was, was just leaving uh, on his way home. Um, he had delivered a baby earlier and been told that there was nothing really happening. <laughs> and so yeah. they were very short staffed as all this was happening. And we ended up uh, an intern walked into the room. And uh, he took one look at the scene of, in the room and said, oh, my goodness, um, she, this woman's got like two minutes of blood left. Gosh. And it, it, was, it was nice to know at least, you know, what a shocking sentence, right? To know you've, you've got two minutes to live. Yeah. I was in absolutely no pain, which I thought was interesting. So I was very lucid throughout what was happening and taking note and you know trying to figure out what it was that was going wrong and sometimes when i go into my story i forget to tell you so i tell you now um, so i don't forget is that the uterus had um, contracted and as the blood was pumping into the uterus to, into the placenta uh, that, that you know cares for the baby and feeds the baby and all that throughout a pregnancy it was pumping in, but it was not pumping back out. And with every pump of blood, it was filling further and further and further, causing this um, hardness in my belly. And at, uh, it got to a certain point where that's all it could hold, and it exploded. Um, my um, entire insides they, uh, were filled with what they called living shrapnel. It just you know, it Gosh. caused a lot of damage from within. And so everything um, was happening all at once. He came in reading, he had a pamphlet as they were putting the gown on him and gloves right in this examination room. Um, he was looking at a, pam a pamphlet that looked like he had never delivered a baby for it, let alone an, a, yeah. an emergency situation. But I... I gave my trust to him. It was, I, I had, you know, I just said, please save my baby. They were trying to, to get a heartbeat on my baby. I didn't know it was a girl at the time, but it was a, mm -hmm. a beautiful little girl um, and they couldn't get her heartbeat and they knew they had to go in right away. Now, I didn't, this was only a matter of, a, of less than five minutes from being in, at the hospital and so my husband out in the waiting room had no idea what was going on. And um, it, uh, as they, they decided to do an emergency C-section, I had no kind of anesthesia, oxygen, wow. a, a regular operating room, you know, the special lights and, you know, even a warm blanket, you know, <laughs> kind of thing, not even an aspirin. It's, they held my arms and legs down and began oh cutting gosh. me. Um, and at first, you know, and, and because there are many, that this was a, a teaching hospital, questions were asked of what that pain was like. And I've been trying to verbalize what that pain was like. Um, because as they cut me, you know, that they've got those sharp, sharp scalpels mm -hmm. that, and I could feel the cut, but it was, um, I have a high tolerance of pain and it felt like salt in a wound, kind of a, a sting, you know, and a sharp sting. It wasn't pleasant, but I thought, oh, oh my goodness, I think I can get through this. I'm, I'm going to just hold still, you know, and let them do their thing and, and save my baby. And that's where my focus was, was in saving the baby. And I'm so, at a loss for words. I don't even know what to say. This is <laughs> <laughs> blowing me away. <laughs> so <please. laughs> It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of rough. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in looking back comically, 
because there was so much blood everywhere that the nurses and doctors were slipping around in their <laughs> shoes in it. it. It covered everything. And they had a, a woman with a mop bucket um, coming in and trying to control that situation. So the doctors were, wouldn't slip all over the place. Oh my gosh. So it was, and as they, um, as they, in a C-section, they have to move organs and things to get to the baby. Well, I didn't know any of that, but I, all of a sudden I felt an, a really intense pain that I could not get away from. It was so painful. And I noticed that the nurse was looping this gray rope around her arm. It was my intestines. What are you? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It, uh, it hurt. <laughs> well, and you're still conscious this whole time. The whole time. Uh, uh, yes. Very lucid. Um, what I did notice was that the ceiling had lifted from the room. I was, there was no longer a ceiling. I was exposed to the outside world and the walls of the room started to come in. They became fluid like and mm -hmm. kind of started to come in. It was, a, it was, and, and I was just observing. I was trying really hard not to panic and let my blood pressure rise so that, I, cause I thought every heart of my, every beat of my heart, more blood was gonna be leaving right. me. And I thought I better try and conserve tried to take deep breaths in the middle of you know, all that pain. Oh and um, so it, it was a fine line I was walking there, um, trying to control my breathing and everything. But as, as the walls were coming in, I noticed that a darkness was coming over in the room and I was losing my eyesight. I was bleeding out and that was one of the first things to go was my eyesight. I could barely see, I kept looking up to see if the lights were on and they were on. But what what became very acute was my hearing. I could hear all over the hospital. I could hear conversations down the hall and phones ringing and whatnot. And as I was trying to calm down, I heard music. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to focus on this music, which was the theme song from MASH. I don't know if you've seen this television. I have program. actually. I used to love yeah. that show. You know that, da, 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 da. Well, yeah. I heard that and I thought, just think of the music, just think of the music. But as I'm trying to think here and the pain is just right here, you know, just like, you know, and I, I finally, I, I was kind of screaming inside of my own head going faint, dang it, faint, you know, it's, um, then you'll be out of the pain. And, and I couldn't make myself faint. <laughs> and finally, it was just enough where I popped out of my body and I was above my body. And it was an extremely gruesome sight. <laughs> right. It was, um, they were trying to revive my baby. And I had heard that they could not find a heartbeat. And I, it, it was so hard to watch that um, knowing that I had lost my baby, um, that I, and, and caveat here, because sometimes I forget when I get into my story, she is fine now. They revived okay. her and she's beautiful and wonderful. So that, but at the time, that's what my, that's what I saw. That's what I heard. And I had had enough. And I decided to, I just, you know, I wanted to add here that popping out of the body it was not hard. It was not scary. In fact, there was something really familiar about that feeling of the freedom of it. It wasn't something where I even questioned it. It was like I had done that before. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seemed completely natural. And I went through the wall into the waiting room and saw my then husband filling out paperwork and that. And I, I took a moment near him and felt you know, really bad for what was to come from them, L losing both of us and um, what was going to happen with my other children. And, and there was a pause there. And then I was still hearing the music and it was drawing me. I, I, <laughs> I left, went down the hallway floating and not even realizing or thinking that anything was weird about that and ended up in a hospital room with a, with a man that was watching MASH. And it's funny because I had that thought, I'm, 
I, as I was, when I was still in my body and listening to that music, I had the thought of, I'm hearing MASH, it's 1035, I'm dying at 1035, I knew exactly, you know, because that's, because that's when MASH came on was right after the national news, right? And so I knew it was 1035, and I, and it was almost kind of a silly thought, but, um, and as, as I was watching this guy watch the program, and realizing that he had no idea that I was in the room with him, I, I thought, oh my goodness, I must be dead because he has no idea I'm here. And as soon as I thought that, oh, I must be dead, I was, I was completely in, in another place and time and everything. What that place was, I still look for the right words mm -hmm. because it was completely black. You could not see your hand in front of your face I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything, but I was, I was cuddled. I was loved. I was the, this darkness, this blackness that I was in knew me, knew my heart, loved me. It, it's hard to even explain that type of love, but I was, I was in such a wonderful place that I could have stayed there forever. And mm -hmm and was comfortable at where I was. But somewhere I started hearing this really irritating voice <laughs> and it was calling my name and it was trying to call me back. Right. Claudia, come back to us. You have a baby, she needs you. And I, and I resisted, I heard myself. Well, at first I, I was trying to ignore the voice and then I thought if I just answer the voice, then maybe it will stop. And I said, no, I'm not coming back. My baby died. I'm staying here. Well, that interaction with back at, with earth or, yeah. you know, whatever. That it realm. Brought, brought, exactly. It brought me back. And now I am uh, painfully back into my body and all that came with it. Uh, you know, afterwards, the hospital had asked me because I had mentioned earlier that it was a teaching hospital, they were interested in two really important questions. And one was trying to describe the pain, mm -hmm. you know, and I had, I didn't have words for the pain. I was trying to explain, you know, where yes. I thought, okay, salt in the wound. And then this, ah, you know, like intense, a, like intense, like, like a soldier on the battlefield that has a gut wound that everybody knows it's fatal and the, the pain and the, and the fear that they must go through, you know, knowing that's it, you know, that's, that was that kind of pain. And um, those were my best two ways to describe it. But the other question, and because um, it was an open-minded, I guess, type of hospital, they, I, I didn't even have to ask had I died or anything. They said, they would say, when you died, where do you remember where you went? Did you right. see anybody? Did you were you know, uh, did did they give you any kind of instruction or say anything? Or they were really I um, again this is 1984, and Dr. Raymond Moody had uh, books out um, with NDEs in yeah. them, and and so I was I was familiar with the concept and that of, of a near-death experience and it but this this was nothing that I had ever read about and I started to talk about it and as I did I I felt a little bit of I want to say shame or something was kind of coming into my explanation because growing up in kind of a rel religious type situation mm -hmm. You know, you equate, you know, going into the light, you know, you hear, you know, here's the tunnel and you go into the light. Right. Well, what about the, those of us who went into the dark? Now, it was wonderful. I, you know, I, but if that was hell, then I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> it was, kind of like, <laughs> it wasn't. That was really good. That was really good. Yeah. But I didn't know how to place it. And I spent so many years um, looking for someone else who had had an experience similar mm -hmm. to mine and that's you know one of the things that you know as far as these podcasts and sitting here talking to you it may open up someone else's experience because mine I 
I shoved it down for 30 years. I was afraid that someone was going to take my experience, which I found to be incredibly sacred. You know, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. And I didn't want to expose it to a negative connotation. Mm, I didn't want judgment. So it judgment and soil it. And so I, I kept it to myself and, um, uh, it was not until many years ago um, that I was attending an IONS conference. Um, I had a friend who um, was going to be speaking there. The IONS is, is an international um, studies of near uh, association of, of needed research. research. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was, and that was wonderful. It was a conference with so many wonderful people there. But I was sitting across from Eben Alexander, Dr. Alexander yeah. at the time. Um, and he was mentioning that if he had had an opportunity to, to direct his own near-death experience, he would have seen his father. His father was a surgeon and he was very close to him. And boy, my ears just perked up because I lost my father when I was 16. And that is why I was, was reading near-death experiences and that I wanted to know where did he go? Where did this vibrant, energetic person? And as I looked at the shell uh, that carried him, um, and he, he wasn't there. He, you know, it, it was just. And I, I, so I really wanted to know what happens after this life, and it propelled me. His death propelled me into this um, search quest exactly exactly it's funny dr moody and D dr alexander have been on the show <laughs> so oh, i love it i love both of it them. yeah well, it a... and and so the stories his story because uh, I'd, I'd heard him speak that morning but he hadn't mentioned this was kind of just in in across the table at lunch with him saying that um, if he could direct his own nde would have mm -hmm. seen his father and boy for me it's like father you know, because yeah. that was one of the the things about my NDE. Where where was my dad? How come I he had not lifted? You know, brought his hand to me and taken me yes. and hugged me and and all of that wonderful stuff. And so I couldn't talk to my mother about even my near death experience because there was an expectation. You know, it's like, well, did you see dad? Mm -hmm. And I didn't see anybody. So um, this, this pushing uh, of the experience and keeping it down, you know, they eventually, it eventually rises when the student, you know, is ready, the teacher will come. Yeah. Um, and that I just started to have dreams, very vivid dreams. And um, I knew that I was, I was getting memories. I was, I had, uh, I had suppressed so much. And I think I think the darkness was actually a, a veil for me to open later that I was not ready or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to explain, but that's kind of what I have, um, uh, what I have found over the years of my own research was that I wasn't ready. And, and now 30 years later, here I am, I'm ready. I was kind of getting mad where it's like, I know there was more that happened to me. I want my own story. I want, I want to know my own story. And um, I started having these dreams. And one of the helpers in my dream was my spirit guide. I didn't know a whole lot about spirit guides. I believed what I did know, I believed in. I thought, thought that someone would was there to you know protect or whatnot. Um, or give those nudges, those intuitions or whatever yeah. that, you know. Um, but uh, I would, I would be in a dream, and I would see him kind of off to the side. I didn't know who it was, but they were dressed in hilarious get-ups. It was, it was so funny um, that I would notice this person dressed up like a fairy, or a whirling dervish, or the Texaco man, or just some costume. And I have since learned that he did that for a reason and that was to pull me out of the dream without waking up and becoming aware that I could be could actually watch my dream taking place and I could what could be inserted as far as um, 
teachings and lessons and memories and spirit school, um, all of those things, he would he would uh, be at the side and he'd hold up a billboard that says, now pay attention to this, you know, and, and the billboard sometimes had, you know, those lights around it or whatever. It's like, look at this, look at this. So he really helped me learn uh, to become lucid within my dreams. And then I would keep my dream journals and, and write about them. That's, that's wonderful. I'm in the process of trying to learn that. <laughs> but I just want to go back to your NDE very briefly. Were, yeah. When you talked about your intestines, you saw your intestines and you knew that potentially you were going to die. Were you afraid? Mm-hmm. I, I, I actually said in my head, I said, oh, so this is how it ends. You know, I'm 31 years, not quite 31 years old so this is how it ends and you know kind of why i wonder why so early right i hadn't done enough living i i can't say that i was afraid there was actually a little part of me that was excited to see my dad again i went i'm going to see dad soon Mm. and so there was this little bit of anticipation and that's why the letdown of not seeing him was so big um so that, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm finding that my answer a little bit odd. Most of us would be fearful, but I didn't feel that fear. I don't know. More like Very. an acceptance. And, yeah. you know, we often associate in our culture darkness or blackness with evil or negativity, mm-hmm. but it's not. E- exactly. That's where I put it. And uh, and you're right. It, it's not. It, it could be beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, I've um, interviewed several other near-death experiences that have gone to that blackness and they call it a place of rest almost. I like that. Yes. I felt like because I had been through so much trauma that yeah. that was that kind of cradling of me and letting me know it's it's going to be okay or whatever. It was a, a, a little respite, you know. It's like the infinite space. Yeah. But I, w- um, I wanted to ask you when you're in that blackness or the infinite space, did you see yourself as a, um, a, a small individual or were you all of that space? Another really good question. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> because when I could hear the uh, they calling my name, it, it was coming into like, it, like, like I could hear it with one of my ears. Mm-hmm though I wasn't um, present enough to, that's probably not the right choice of word, but to to think that I had a body, I I think I felt like I was more part of that space, that that I was just kind of enfolded into that, the entirety of that space, but that there was a part of me that, that still remembered the body or something like that, that yes. this ear could hear me, that this ear could hear. Um, it's the best way I can explain. You know, that often happens when people pass, they're still associated with their physical form. It, yeah. had, it hadn't yeah. been too long. Um, and, and people always talk about this, but I have to ask the question. Well, this is two questions. How will you change after this experience? And did you come back with gifts? I think you started talking about your lucid dreaming, but yeah. Yeah. People have fundamental changes after a near-death experience. You know, and for me, um, being such a busy mom of five children now, and one wow. of them, and my the daughter that was born got to go home long before I did. So I, I actually missed a lot of that early bonding with my little one, and you know, just kind of having to um, jump back into life, so to speak, to the normalcy of life. Um, after having that time in the hospital to ponder, because they would bring in blood source, you know, a a bag of blood. Mm -hmm. And I became like a vampire as it would come in the room because every, you know, how things had gotten really dark as I was leaving my body. Mm -hmm. As I lay there and new blood came, the lightness, the room would become lighter in that again. And so I craved the blood that was coming into the room. It was, and so your question, as far as 
I pondered it and I think every day I was there, I pushed it a little bit farther away. I um, ended up kind of totally changing my life, um, got divorced and remarried and whatnot. And, and so in those 30 years, what I did was more of a, a secret type search, not um, secret isn't a very good word either, but I, I kept the search up, but I didn't, it wasn't, you know, the first thing out there that everyone knew about me. I would read uh, uh, NDE uh, accounts and I, if I had read one similar to, to my own, I may have adjusted earlier than I did. Um, but it, even at the 30 year mark, it was more my own intense longing to know what I had missed and what had been um, veiled from me that I just kind of got, you know, agitated and said, come on, you know, I'm, I've been doing the work. I'm, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm trying. Curious. To, yeah. And, and I know that the entire uh, event, both, both my dad and, and other things that happened in my NDE was this carrot that would just, you know, pull me along in my own curiosity. And so when I, it got to a point where I was meeting, you know, these wonderful speakers at, at IONS and that, that I thought, they've got a story. I know I've got a story. Where's my story? <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's when I started having those dreams. Wonderful. So I'd love to hear more about, you spoke about intuition and your, your dreams and what you've been shown yes. in your dreams. Yes. Well, what, one of the things in my dreams is I call it spirit school and the billboard that's kind of held up is kind of like tonight's lesson and they are in lesson form because as I got you know you're asking how it changed me mm -hmm. and I started to become more vocal I started owning it and even though I didn't have the story of my own NDE um, or at least the whole story mm -hmm. what I had was learning watching podcasts such as this one and waking up with a knowing of that that speaker you know was was on point and it resonated with me and as you start accepting some of these things more and more is offered to you you know and yeah. i call it kind of the spiritual puzzle you know and it's like every now and again you get that that piece of the puzzle right and and um i was i was at a hairdresser's one time this really sweet gal um and we, you know, when you, when you talk in, in the hairdresser's chair, you know, yeah. nothing's off topic, right? It's funny. Things. That's such a funny thing. Hairdressers yeah. know everything. They know everything. I don't know they what know it is. We just open our hearts to hairdressers, don't we? <laughs> they know your inner secrets. We started talking about spiritual stuff. And one day I explained to her about the spiritual puzzle. She had a, a large picture of Marilyn Monroe just above her station. And I said, you know, I, I feel like I have several pieces now of this puzzle, but they could be down here in the corner of this picture. And everything that I think I know, I have no idea what that big picture is. Mm -hmm. And you can have some puzzles. She lost her mother and whatnot. And, and her pieces of her puzzle could be up here. And no one would even know that there was this beautiful, voluptuous Marilyn Monroe um, you know, with a pink telephone and, you know, somebody might have a piece of pink. And, and so I think it's really important for these type of shows in that where we can kind of share each other's puzzle pieces and perhaps build that puzzle together, working together, sharing each other's pieces. So the wholeness. To exactly. Exactly. So um, one of the lessons that I learned in spirit school was called um, description, the layering effect. And because there's this question of, you know, why are we here? What is our purpose? Why, why this veil? Not my, even my mm -hmm. personal veil, but why did we come here in this veil of, of, we don't remember. You know, yes, you're, like, you're, you're, you, can, you can do the questions and the answers. This is perfect. I'll just listen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're always my questions. <laughs> well, um, this particular lesson was, it was regarding uh, the, um, 
my spirit guide, and then there's a teacher. And I was not a great student in school, but I but in spirit school, the teacher is so in your head space kind of thing. There's a such a willingness for you to get it, to mm-hmm. get what they're trying to teach you, that they look for different ways, but they're they're with you, you know, to to help prod you on. And one of the things that I learned was how, you know, it's kind of like, okay, so we all have, we're questioning, we will pray or we'll ask or, you know, whatever is your personal way of a connection to God, um, you know, for answers. And the explanation was trying to show how hard it was to give us in our humanness, these type of answers, because there has to be a building of knowledge so so that um it's it's a layering so that we can get it so we can understand it because it's so far beyond our capabilities Mm -hmm. if to just give us all in one piece we can't hold them that type of information so it's built upon um layer by layer and one of the examples that he used was in um in the 19 late 50s, 60s, there was a type of material that people made for couch pillows. It was really pretty ugly <laughs> fabric. It was um, a kind of a, a see-through type brown with pink little dots on it. And the dots were like made of velvet or something. They called it dotted Swiss. Mm-hmm. So here's this pink and brown pillow with these really different opposing type fabrics on it. And he said, and he pushed his pillow in at me and said, describe this pillow. And I said, well, you know, it's a brown pillow and it's got some pink dots. And he was like, no, really explain this pillow because what if I don't know what brown looks like? You know, what if I've never seen this type of fabric? Yeah, and he said, awesome. I want, yeah. And he said, I want you to really dig deep. And I want you to pretend like you're trying to, that you're over the phone and that you're talking to your son, uh, my son, Jesse, whom we can get, we can do spiritual, we can get deep. It's, it's wonderful to have someone to talk to that way. And he says, pretend like you're talking to Jesse and tell him about this pillow. And I really, I'm turning it around and I'm looking at it. And I, I said, you know, this brown, it's, it's a translucent, like, like an onion, you know, those different layers at the very top where, where it gets deeper in color. Um, but as you peel those layers, you know, it's, it's less and less color. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to explain, an un- and then he says, well, tell me about an onion. And I, I was like, well, it's pungent and it's, you know, and, and I realized how hard that was as I'm on this imaginary telephone to my son trying to explain this pillow to him. And he just, he went and he says, you know, uh, kind of on a tangent as far as, you know, this is why it is so hard to give, just give the answer because it, it has to be, you have to grow into the answer. And I, and so, and he said, we don't, and I, you haven't even begun to tell me about what those little pink dots are. And I just went and we, and we had gone round and round trying to explain this pillow. So it was really an aha uh, spirit school for me to go yes, okay yes. words and don't do it exactly and it's probably like a near-death experience as well because to explain it in words it just doesn't do it justice it's hard exactly. to describe something I haven't experienced you yeah. you you feel it in your heart but to put it into words can be very um complex so thanks thanks for yeah. <laughs> doing well, a great job there what that what that brought up for me was a memory of being on the other side and you get you, everything makes sense when you're there you know it's like all the answers it, it seems like you go oh uh-huh oh that's why oh how oh yeah but when it's time to come home it's like you have this an ocean full of knowledge right it's it's so big but you but you're given a little paper cup to carry it home in and it's like how do I, how do I carry this back with me and share it? Um, and I get emotional about this because I, I visually could see my paper cup and some, and at times I really examine what is inside of it because it's like 
every droplet within that paper cup is the essence of the entire ocean. It does carry that knowledge, but I have to look at every, every piece of it to kind of bring back a lot of that knowledge. So that was a really important spirit school for me. It opened a lot of doors. I've got to ask a question. I'm sure people will be asking this. Everyone wants to, well, many people want to connect with their spirit guides and yeah. remember parts of the dream. Well, I certainly do. Do you yeah. have any tools or tips that you can offer the audience? Yes. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.